properly in a trust, and uh, if she dies uh, within 21 years and there's a disposition, there is no capital gains tax to pay at that particular time. It's spread out. And uh, if uh, we are particularly worried about assets in the trust that have been invested with the proceeds of the insurance, one can always make a disposition of those assets before the 21st uh, year. So that is rather important. Now, I'd like to set up another situation when we talk about educational uh, trusts. Uh, and it's rather amazing, and there was an article in the, the Toronto Star almost two years ago, and when you analyze it, it makes sense, but it says no cost frills of educating your child came to $85,262. That's probably gone up today, and without getting into the, the reasoning, that's fine. Now, if that all has to come out of tax paid dollars from a parent somehow along the line from the day uh, raising the child from day one on, one can realize it becomes rather expensive. And I'm simply suggesting that if at least a portion of this can be put into a trust and have the child pay his or her own income tax, then there is a great deal of saving to be made. Then too with the, the use of insurance with a, with a trust that as opposed to a trust where you fund and have to manage each year, I suggest in my notes that where grandparents so often like to give their grandchild a thousand dollars or say put this away, this will help his college education in a particular time, if that thousand dollars were put into a single premium deferred annuity for a simple matter of only four years on today's rates from age one to age four, in 18 years that's accumulated only using a 10% figure approximately $5,500 each. So at age 18 the child can be paid out uh, that amount each year on that child's behalf, not all of which is even taxable, and you have no headaches of management or so, and a parent makes a vital contribution. One thing that becomes very difficult, and I know it is, is hard for uh, people wanting to uh, uh, benefit children, and uh, I specifically refer to grandparents, and that includes aunts, older people, godparents, so on, want to benefit the children, but it becomes a real nuisance if they give father $500 if they give him even uh, shares of Bell Telephone or so, then he's being given it on trust. He has to do a declaration of trust. If there's income is earned on any of those particular small amounts of funds, there are tax returns that have to be filed each year, and it becomes a real nuisance. And that's why I suggest that sometimes you can, uh, although I'm not always in favor of insurance companies, you can let the insurance company have the headaches of handling it and a great deal of benefit uh, can come out. Now, we have lots of uses of trusts I set out. I don't want to get into them all. I just don't have time. But I want to do mention a few of them. I've mentioned, first of all, the assets out of the jurisdiction before. And um, Mr. Fitzpatrick referred to multiple wills. And that, to me, of course, is my uh, favorite way of uh, doing things. And so often we find now people having assets in other jurisdictions. Uh, as you know, we've had a great uh, deal of immigration into this country since the last war. To a large extent, those people were perhaps fairly young. Uh, they come in from different uh, countries, especially from Europe, and now they're finding that relatives over there are dying, leaving them a piece of property perhaps in Italy or France, wherever it might be. Uh, for some reason, they want those assets uh, to remain, and I'm suggesting that instead of uh, perhaps bringing them into our jurisdiction in different ways, then one might uh, let them simply sit there in a trust to be governed by the terms of the trust, bearing in mind that not all civil law countries recognize a trust as such. Uh, the trust is a concept really of the common law, but uh, where it does exist, it's a very useful uh, vehicle. We use trust for specialized management of property sometimes, 
and let me visualize the busy medical practitioner perhaps has some rental property. He may have it in a company that presents one uh, alternative, but he may want to put it into a trust. And uh, the trust with, again, depending on who the beneficiaries of the trust are, affords a very useful vehicle for paying out the income that is earned in that particular trust as opposed to a corporate arrangement uh, that uh, has a profit, pays tax, and then, of course, if it wants to bring money out by way of dividends or so, involves a further tax to uh, the beneficiary. So that is one particular use for specialized management of property with a trust. At the same time, people sometimes own very volatile stocks, uh, and they are people, often businessmen, who travel in different areas of the world, and if those stocks are held by a trustee, then they can be dealt with perhaps immediately and um, not have to worry about having them either left at a brokerage office or giving specific powers of attorney. It's just another... Uh, uh, reason for having it. Avoiding probate and publicity is becoming, while not common, not uncommon for having a trust. I mentioned to you earlier a trust that's revocable and then irrevocable. It's not uncommon for someone, especially if he's getting older, especially if he's invalid or he's very busy or using uh, the word for whatever connotation you wish to place on it, that he is famous and doesn't want to uh, have his estate probated and therefore become public knowledge, which uh, probated estates really are if someone chooses to get the record out. And in former years, the newspapers now, they're too busy, at least in this jurisdiction, the smaller jurisdictions, they still search the surrogate court and say, Jones left $200,000, of which 50000 went to his mistress or something, and it uh, becomes rather embarrassing, but through the means of a living trust, that is never made public. So for whatever reason, he saves probate fees. Now, sure, you might say, well, if a man has $800,000 and he serves, saves $4,000 in probate fees, that isn't very large. But take the idea that where trustees are looking after that trust for him when he dies and they already have the assets under their jurisdiction and they don't have to get in more assets, he's saving two and a half percent on the capital receipts of that and then when you start adding that up in the 800,000 it becomes a little more meaningful. So, and there is, the other reason is, again, there is no delay at death, no probate to have to get. The assets are there, they're in the names of the trustees, they can deal with them right away. Again, shares in a, in a business may really be uh, very meaningful. So Now, to create those assets in the trust, though, it's not just as simple as putting them all in. Uh, it is for succession duties, but we have to be very careful with uh, income tax because at death, if he retains control of them during his lifetime, there can be a, a disposition, a deemed disposition. So it's just not all easy, but it can be uh, very, very useful. Now, if he makes that trust revocable during his lifetime, he can call it off any time. He can take monies out of it when he wants. He can do, he has virtually full control. Then if it becomes irrevocable upon his death, as it were, he simply embodies the terms of his will in that trust, and the trustees uh, then go ahead with his will. Now, that generally works, although I saw it backfire once with an individual who set up one of these about 20 years ago, what he didn't do was he kept a bank account with about $5,000 and it wasn't a joint account with right of survivorship or he would have escaped so they had to probate the estate to uh, uh, clear the $5,000 and uh, one of the uh, still in existence sort of, uh, well I won't describe them, reporters on the air picked this up and said, well, this fellow really died a poor man, and uh, he was supposed to be so wealthy. What they didn't know is he had a living trust with about $6 million in it. But uh, he just didn't go the full extent. If he had simply kept that account in his latter years when he was ill and had a right of survivorship, you wouldn't have had a probate to get that uh, $5,000, and of course the living trust took care of everything else. Now, I do mention a few other trusts in here sometimes for self-protection. They're useful. The, the spendthrift, I, I had one case a few years ago when I guess it was the Olympic lottery that first started with a million dollars. 
uh, fellow came in to, to see me about a month after he had won a million dollars. He had 700000 left. He said, everybody's coming after me. I'm giving it away. So we put it all into a trust for self-protection. And I know today he's very happy living off the income from it. And it's in the discretion of his trustees if he ever gets any capital. So, and he just says to people, I can't do anything anymore. And, but those are things that uh, <laughs> are useful. So, um, there are a lot of applications for trusts. A new one coming on to the, to the scene in Canada and uh, following from the United States is the so-called Unitrust. Now, I want to mention this because I think it does have some application, although it can be a little fraught with income tax problems. And the concept is simply this, that Today, by way of illustration, let's take the case where we maybe have 12% inflation or so. Now, if I leave an estate of a fair substantial amount of money or a reasonable amount and I want to benefit my wife and let's say the income should be enough, I say to her or I say to my trustees, look, she's got to get 12% every year on that particular account in order to maintain her proper standard of living. And then that seems reasonable. Then we look to then what the trustee has to do. Now, a year ago or so, he could be getting 18 to 20 percent on his money. And if he did that and invested the whole estate in 18 or 20 percent and she was simply getting all the income, he was really prejudicing the remainder men because uh, the estate wasn't growing if we put that into fixed term securities. On the other hand, we get periods uh, where the market is very volatile or there are very uh, good opportunities to invest in common securities that may only pay a yield of 5 or 6 percent, but they have a very good growth factor. So then we have the shoe on the other foot that prejudices the life tenant but benefits the remainder men. So the so-called unit trust concept is, says that, Mr. Trustee, you invest whatever you want and you take the basic amount of the, the uh, money that you started the year with, at the end of the year you add to it all the income or the capital growth, of course, will be there, you get a new figure, then you give the life tenant 12% of that amount of money. Let me perhaps illustrate. Suppose we had 500000 and uh, we were investing at 10% only, that's all the, the return we got. Then at the end of the year, uh, we have $550,000. And if you are giving her 12%, then that's going to drop below the 500 originally. So what you're going to be doing, and this is where I mentioned the tax aspect, you're going to be giving her income of 50000 and you're going to be giving her capital of 10000 which she'll pay no tax on. Now, let's go the other way. Suppose we're investing 15% at 15 percent. Uh, then we get up at the end of the year at 575,000. We have to give her 12 percent of that, whatever it works out to, but it's not going to be the whole 75,000. So you give her the 12 percent, she pays full tax on it, and then you have to, of course, accumulate the rest of the income and pay an accumulation tax on that, which is not low, but if you're dealing in fairly substantial numbers, it's not bad, and that extra income factor, as we would have realized last year in the markets around this time, then benefits the remainder men as well. So this is coming on to the scene. It's not very difficult uh, really to uh, draft, and uh, I think it is very useful. Now, I'm going to say one more thing because I see now we're going over the time. I did include in uh, the, the material so you'll see a sample of a so-called family trust providing income splitting. But someone asked me before, was I going to speak about non-resident trusts? And I'll, I'll say a very few words. And someone said, well, why do you want them? Uh, or at least the question asked. First of all, retirement purposes. People are very concerned in that we're one of the few jurisdictions in the world that doesn't have foreign exchange control. And people are concerned if it ever comes in this country and I have my condominium in Florida or something, and how am I going to get my money out each year if we have foreign exchange called to go and live there or better still to go and retire there or in the south of Spain or whatever it might be. So they set up non-resident trusts today to build those up 
in and again capital gains tax to be paid if they have to produce uh, assets uh, taking them out to produce the monies but if they're simply dealing with cash there's no tax problems at all so that is one reason Diversity of investment is one that I find uh, more than anything. Uh, I'm not being hypercritical, but if you have a couple hundred thousand dollars today and you go down into an investment counselor, he's going to want to put you into securities in Canada or the United States. And I suggest to you that there may be better opportunities in the world, in Europe, in Australia, in Japan, and so on. And often people like to center some funds like this in a jurisdiction such as Switzerland that are far more sophisticated in investing than uh, we seem to be and uh, can avail themselves of those opportunities. The other thing I touched upon briefly before is that people have property in foreign jurisdictions that they don't want to let go so they can have a non-resident trust to take care of that. And perhaps the last one, I'm not even going to touch it here, it wouldn't have time, is the possible probable avoidance of income tax uh, by having a non-resident trust. So I'll stop right there because it's now time for coffee break. Let's try and keep it a little short and we'll come back in 10, 12 minutes. Thank you. Tell us that we didn't have about preferred beneficiary elections in the family trust that we gave. And while there isn't one big clause, you'll find it on page 86. So just for that person who was worrying about it. Now, our next speaker, Mr. J. Shepard, uh, has a rather outstanding academic career and is continuing that. Uh, when he graduated from Osgoode Hall in 1978, he was first in the class of over 300 and uh, took down too many prizes and scholarships that I can repeat here in the time we have. He continued on the bar admission course and uh, as far as we know, he was the only person who successfully completed the bar admission course and also a prize winner there who got his LLM the same year in the University of Toronto and was working on a book he was publishing. And uh, he did publish a book, came out last year on the law of fiduciaries by Carswell and he has another one in process to be published on tax plan shareholders agreement. So I can't think of anyone better to speak to us on the ramifications of trust and income tax than Mr. J. Shepard, who I might also add is with Blaney Pasternak. Good morning. Um, when I was preparing this lecture, I couldn't find a way to get all of this material into 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, indeed, it took me 40 pages just to give a superficial outline of personal tax planning in the materials. In any case, I don't think there's any point in me going over what's in the materials. I don't think any explanations I could add in these few minutes would elucidate it further. And I don't think the purpose of this session today is to turn you into tax planners. Um, as I've noted in my paper, the tax specialist and the general practitioner have different and both important roles in planning a client's financial affairs. The tax specialist is trained to find answers to the client's needs and to explain those answers and to implement them. However, he rarely is in a position to see the client until someone else, usually a general practitioner, has identified the needs themselves, usually in the context of overall will or estate planning. That is to say, people don't come in to me to get their wills done, at least very rarely. Usually they're my friends and they don't have any money, so there's no tax planning to be done. Um, they come in to you to have their wills done. So I don't get a chance to see the opportunities for tax planning, it's you that see those opportunities. It's you that know the clients, that, uh, that have dealt with them on their real estate transactions and on their, uh, their setting up their companies and uh, perhaps on their divorces and things like that. And so you, you have a more intimate involvement with the individuals. And when an opportunity is there, it's, it's your role to spot it, to see that it is there so that the client can then um, have, the, have that opportunity pursued. For, the, for this reason, this morning I'd like to concentrate on how to spot those possibilities, and that involves two things. 
first of all, you have to know the types of information, the, the facts that generate tax planning opportunities. And secondly, you have to know what opportunities are indicated by those facts. So I've, I've provided a couple of case studies. And what I'd like to do is go through them and point out to you things in those case studies that suggest ways to save tax and what it is that can be done. I'm not going to tell you the mechanics of, uh, of how to do it, but not in any, uh, in any specific way, just what it is that is there. I, I should tell you that both of these case studies are actual situations that I've seen at least once and then uh, I think in the second one many, many times. I've altered them a bit for obvious reasons, but they're real situations and they happen regularly. The first case study deals with the, uh, with the Martins. And they're a couple in their 40s with four school-aged children. They have a pretty fair amount of money um, as a result of inheritances, and it's, it's evenly split between the couple. Um, and they're spending a good deal of money on the education of their children in some private schools and in university. Okay, the facts that are key for a tax lawyer in this situation, for a tax planner in this situation, are the high annual incomes, uh, most of which they, they can't spend, and that indicates some form of sheltering, tax sheltering is needed. Um, they have a lot of available cash, cash that they don't need for anything else, and that is one of the prerequisites to income splitting. Because of their relatively even distribution of incomes, income splitting, the most common type of income splitting as between one spouse and another is not indicated. And as well, the high educational costs indicate that some form of income splitting with the children is indicated. Um, they, have a, they have a mortgage and they have enough money to pay it off and as I'll suggest in a minute, that's just obvious they should pay it off. Um, they have an expressed intention to give money to particular charities. And usually when there, are, when there is charitable gifting, there are some tax planning considerations there. And finally, they're earning two or $300,000 a year on investments, paying the tax on it, and then re putting it back into their portfolio and reinvesting it. And whenever a tax planner hears the words paying tax in that context, he knows he's got to do something about that. Well, with a few basic techniques, these people should be able to save about forty or fifty thousand dollars a year in tax. Now they could conceivably save one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars in tax, but they probably would not want to take the steps necessary to do that. And so instead, I'll, I'll deal with the, with the things that they probably will want to do one way or the other. Now, if I can find my notes. With, with every client, and I, and I say this uh, um, knowing that every is a bit strong a word, with every client, I think the first tax planning opportunity you should be thinking of is registered retirement savings plans. It's easy to assume that your clients are doing that. They aren't. If they were, there'd be a lot more in RRSPs in Canada than there is. Um, in this particular case, you have people who have somewhat unusual situations for RRSP planning. Um, the husband is a, a vice president of an insurance company. He's probably got a pension plan with all the bells and whistles and using up all of his entitlement to any sort of retirement funding. He may not have any entitlement to put money into an RRSP. You should still ask the question. He may have missed $1,000 or $1,500 in annual contributions, and so is throwing away a tax saving of seven or $800. In the wife's case, however, she is probably not using um, an RRSP advantage that she, that she has available to her. Because she just come back into the workforce, she has a relatively low earned income, she may be thinking, well, I don't have to worry about this, it's not important to me. And in fact, um, in the particular situation I had just like this one, that's exact, exactly what was the case. But 
and, and what she thought was, because she only had a low earned income, she wasn't going to save that much in tax by putting money into an RRSP. She figured, well, earned income is only taxed at low rates, right? Uh, it's my investment income that I'm paying the big tax dollars on, but I can't put RRSP money in for investment income. And what she failed to realize is that RRSP contributions come off the top. And every penny she would have put into an RRSP, or, or the woman in the example here, can put into an RRSP, probably $3,000, will save her 50 cents, uh, every dollar will save her 50 cents in tax. And that's just, it's an opportunity to uh, have the government send you a check for $1,500 and anybody who doesn't want the government to do that, um, have, have, have your clients, have the government send the check to me. Um, okay, now paying off the mortgage. They're paying 13.5% on $60,000 a year they're, um, they are not being allowed to deduct that 13.5%, that $8,000 a year. Um, and yet, they have investments that they're probably earning 16 or 17% and they're paying 50% tax on it. That is clearly a gift to the government. Uh, and you might as well give it to charity. Um, as a general rule, when people are in the high tax bracket, they should pay off debts where the interest rate on the debt is more than half what they get on their investments. And the reason is that they're paying 50% tax, so unless this, this mortgage were at 8 or 8.5% 8 or lower, they're better off in the end to get rid of it. And that is true in, in most cases. Uh, in a very rare exception, you'll find that uh, that you shouldn't pay off the mortgage, but in almost every case you should. Charitable gifting. They, are, they have set up in their will for $25,000 each to a couple of charities. Um, they don't need the charitable deduction the, against their income when they're dead. They need it today. Um, the way to do that is for them to go to the charity and say, buy an insurance policy on my life for $25,000. I'll give you a, a donation every year to pay the premium, and when I die, you'll get $25,000. But meanwhile, each time I make that donation each year, I'll get a, a charitable deduction. I'd rather have that charitable de deduction now than later. Now, the, the two things that are going to save them a lot of money here are income splitting and a shift in their investment mix. Now, income splitting, I think the easiest way to understand income splitting, and I've used this time and time again with clients, is um, make the assumption that you're an individual with a big column, like this high, of income. Now, all the income down at the very bottom of the column is taxed at low rates. Right about here, it starts all getting taxed at 50%. And all the way up, it's all taxed at 50%. Now, the idea of income splitting is you take a saw, chop off that column, and put it down on the ground over there. Now, all that stuff that was taxed at 50% is being taxed at low rates. And indeed, you can chop it up into a whole bunch of little pieces and have it not taxed at all, which is what is normally done. In this case, what, what is probably necessary is an educational trust. The Martins have are paying $15,000 a year in direct educational costs and probably another 15 or 20 in indirect costs including allowances and residence fees and this and that and the other thing. Um, in order to get that, say $30,000 to pay those expenses, most of which are not deductible to them, they have to earn $60,000 in investment income. They earn the 60, they pay 30 in tax, they have 30 left over to pay all these expenses. It would be much better if they didn't have to pay that tax, if they just had to earn $30,000 in order to pay the expenses. Well, it can be done. What they do is they set up a trust, a, a simple family trust, discretionary income, all that sort of stuff, um, and for their four children. They settle a nominal amount on that trust, any amount that's settled on a trust for one's children uh, gives rise to attribution rules, and the income on that is taxed to the settlor, so you don't want any income on the money you've settled on the trust. 
And then they lend, probably in this case, $200,000 to the trust at no interest. Demand promissory note comes back from the trustees, and the trust goes out and invests that $200,000 at and gets $30,000 a year in, in uh, interest or dividends or whatever. The trust used that money to pay the tuition fees, the, um, the allowances for the children perhaps, buy some clothes for them for school, books, etc., etc. That income is all taxed to the children. By the time they've deducted their regular exemptions, their tuition, and all the other things that they're allowed to deduct, they will pay no tax on it. And the Martins will have saved $30,000 a year. And that is, it is one of the simplest ways of saving taxes for people who have some cash that, that I can think of. And in fact, it's very, very common. Now, the other thing that is crucial for these people is that they're earning a whole bunch of income every year that they don't want and they don't need. They want their portfolio, their big fund of money, to grow in value, but they don't need that growth each year. And yet they've got their portfolio set up in income-producing investments, so they do have to pay tax every year. One of the, the, you, you'll note that they have a broker. One of the things they should be considering is going to that broker and saying, shift the mix of what I have away from term deposits and corporate bonds and things like that towards assets which have the relatively similar yields but not on an income basis, on a growth basis. Blue chip stocks, um, maybe real estate, things like that. Now obviously in situations like that you have to deal with the predilections of the client. Some don't want to go into those sorts of investments. But many don't understand how much it's costing them not to. Um, and by doing a little bit of balancing and moving over a few assets to growth assets, they can probably save very substantial amounts. In that context, they might want to consider tax shelters. Taking some of their income each year, um, they have a fund of maybe a million and a half dollars, um, and that's probably generating about $250,000 a year in income, something like that taking some of that income, which they don't need anyway, and which is subject to tax, and placing it in sheltered investments so that it all becomes deductible. That will give a high-risk component to their portfolio, um, but they will have the leverage of that tax shelter in those investments. And there are a number of, uh, of types of investments like that, not just MERBs, but uh, research and development funds, uh, mining funds, this and that and the other thing, a few pretty weird ones as well. In terms of will planning, in terms of will planning, I've indicated in my paper that I think spouse trusts in wills are used far too many times. That it is only in a very rare situation that you ever need a spouse trust, and I, 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 I think that people get tied up get caught up with the tax gimmickry of a spouse trust and think it's going to do somebody some, some good. Often it doesn't. This may be one of those situations in which a spouse trust is, is appropriate. There's a significant amount of money. The surviving spouse does not need the money from the, the first to die. Um, and it therefore may be, may be a good idea to put the money aside to go on to the, to the uh, children or even perhaps the grandchildren at, uh, at some point in the near future, even perhaps the grandchildren, um, rather than an outright distribution. Now, finally on the Martins, the thing that is maybe the most important thing you can do for them, it's cost them several hundred thousand dollars to have this large amount of money for five years without any tax planning. The, best thing you can do for them is tell them to get an accountant. They should have had one in the first place. Um, I can't imagine why anybody would have a broker and not have an accountant, but, uh, um, and that I say even though tax lawyers and accountants tend to be in competition, nevertheless an accountant would have saved them a lot of money by seeing these things a lot earlier than you did. And we'll see things in the future. Okay, let me go to the second example.
The second situation is an amalgam of about oh, seven or eight that I've seen, and I'm sure you recognize it as similar to ones that you've seen more than once. At least I hope your clients are being as successful as the people in the example. What are the facts that are relevant to the planner? Well, the clients have healthy incomes, but they don't have very high incomes. They have enough to pay their bills and perhaps do a little <laughs> saving, but nothing much more than that. They don't have any liquid assets. They have no cash. And one of the things that indicates is that we're not going to be doing any regular income splitting here unless you have free cash. And I, I give you a warning here. People would like to borrow to do income splitting. It doesn't work. Try it every which way you can. It just does not work. You must have free cash that you just got invested in order to do any income splitting of the normal type. So we can, we can cut that out. In any case, they probably don't need it. Need it. Neither of them is at the, the maximum tax rate yet. One's making 50000 and the other's making 35000 a year. The maximum tax rate for the average person with normal deduction starts at about $70,000. Um, the most important fact here, obviously, is that they have a major growth asset, growth asset, which is shares in an active business. The other couple of comments are they have young children, and they have relatively low insurance. Now, as I said before, the first thing you look at is registered retirement savings plans. Now, there they would say to you, we don't have any money. Sure, we can put $5,500 a year into our RSPs, but we don't have the cash to do it. And I think the answer has got to be an RSP contribution for a person in this sort of situation with no other retirement funding and with fairly good tax savings available for that RSP contribution. <coughs> it should be a high priority to them. And if it means making monthly pay payments to a plan or something like that, they should probably do it. I mean, obviously, they don't take food off the table to do it. But um, it may be more important than the sailboat they've been eyeing. Um, the second thing is they have uh, a mortgage. If they can get any free cash together, of course, they should try to pay off the mortgage. Now, as between an RRSP contribution and paying off the mortgage, clearly the RRSP should be contributed to first. Uh, I won't go through working out all the figures and everything, but the difference is really <coughs> substantial. And people have heard for years and years, pay off your mortgage as fast as you can. And indeed, they like to get rid of debt. But and as, as long as they know how much it's costing them to do that, fine. But many people do that not knowing that they could be saving a great deal more by using the RRSP route. Now, this example obviously has been set up to show a situation in which an estate freeze may be appropriate. An estate freeze is a transaction in which a person who has growth assets, assets which are increasing in value, exchanges them for assets which have the same present value but will not increase in value in the future. And I've always found the easiest way to describe that is this way. Shares have, for our purposes, four main attributes. They have a present value, in this case $600,000. They have voting rights. They have a right to participate in future value as the residual value of the company. And um, they have a... Uh, 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 well, forget the fourth one because we don't care. I don't remember what it is. My mind's gone blank. The present value we want to keep with the, the freezer. The future value we want to transfer to the children. And the voting rights we can put either way, but normally we keep with the freezer. That is, we'll take one class of shares and we'll take their attributes and shift them into two classes of shares. One class that the freezer will keep and another class which will go to a trust for the children. Now, in a situation like this, Pauline Andrews has a $600,000 asset, and it's growing at a, a value of, at an increase in value of about 40% a year, which means in two years it'll be worth a million, and a million two. Every dollar that it increases, increases her accrued, her latent capital gain 
on the disposition of those shares, which is probably on her death if she, uh, if she is looking at this as a career type of situation. Now, on a, on an, in an estate freeze, you fix a cap on her gain. You say, on your death, you'll never have a capital gain of more than $600,000 because you will have already transferred all of the value that accrues in the future to your children and they won't be dying at your death so they won't have any disposition and any realization of gains. Now as neat and tidy as that is and as much as tax planners like that, um, in this situation the client is probably too young and does not have enough money in terms of a, a, a huge fund to do a full estate freeze right now. Uh, this client would find if she, if she went through a freeze right now, I think she would find that five or ten years from now she would be regretting the fact that her children through a trust would have ten or twenty times the assets that she had personally. She might be upset. And as, as a matter of fact, as uh, Al and I have just finished working on one in which exactly that happened. It was done about twenty years ago and now the, uh, the parents have about five or six hundred thousand dollars in assets, but the children have millions and millions and millions. We didn't start it 20 years ago. No, we didn't do it 20 years ago. <laughs> we just tried to fix it now. But you don't need to do a full estate freeze when you do freezing. You can do a partial estate freeze. You can do a, um, a freeze in which you transfer 25 percent or a third or 50 percent of the future growth and value of your assets to your children. And probably in this case, that's what, what one w might recommend to the client, uh, a 25% freeze or a 50% freeze to start shifting value to the children, but not all of it yet. All right, two other comments I should make. Because these are shares in an active business corporation, there is a rollover under the Income Tax Act on death to children. That's in addition to the rollover to spouses. There's a rollover to children. Maximum $200,000 in gain. Not taxable gain, but gain. Um, you can do that by having an outright distribution will and then having the surviving spouse leave the shares to the children in the next will. The problem that arises in many cases is that the surviving spouse doesn't operate the business, just keeps it as an investment. And the corporation ceases to qualify for the $200,000 rollover. So what I generally recommend, and I commend this to you, is that you put in the first will that $200,000 to the children and there's a special type of trust you can set up which Revenue Canada accepts um, that will allow you to get the rollover right then and then later on if, um, if the spouse doesn't use the corporation for its original active business purpose you haven't lost that $200,000 saving. Um, the other comment I should make is concerning insurance. Obviously these people don't have enough insurance. Uh, given their lifestyle and the consequences, that, apparent consequences that would hit them if one of them died since they need both incomes and they have no assets to speak of. Um, one, th one thing they might do obviously is insure their mortgage. That would certainly help a, a great deal. Um, another thing they should probably do is have a little more in the way of term insurance but from a tax point of view, the thing that is important is if, under the present situation, Pauline dies, her shares in that company will have to be sold to pay the tax on the capital gain. In order to avoid that, it is possible to buy an insurance policy on her life, or actually probably on the life of the last one of the two of them to die, sufficient to pay the tax, $150,000 face value. It's relatively inexpensive at their ages and it means that you can retain that asset after death rather than selling it and having the company goes, go to others. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. I'll just make one general comment. 
I, I, I can't stress enough how much tax planners rely on non-tax specialists to spot planning opportunities. As you can see even from my examples, the people I see tend to be people who have a lot more money than average. They have a lot of things to be done and they can save a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars and therefore they don't care about spending several thousand on legal fees. And, and so they'll walk in my door and it won't bother them. The people who can use tax planning the most are people in middle income and upper middle income ranges for whom a few simple tricks that are very inexpensive can save them amounts that are significant to them, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a year. Um, but uh, we rely very heavily on you to see those things, and in some cases where they're simple, do, doing them yourself, or referring them or having the person in your firm who, uh, who, does, uh, who does that sort of thing do them. If, if you're able to spot those facts, you can do your clients a very good service um, in addition to the normal things that you're doing. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the uh, next speaker who I will introduce to you is uh, Gordon Hill. And uh, Gordon was called to the bar in 1971. Gordon is very involved with both the wills and trusts section of uh, the Canadian bar as well as the bar admission course. He's an instructor as well as a lecturer in the estate planning and administration section of the bar admission course and he is uh, on the executive and uh, now is an officer of the wills and trust section of the Canadian Bar Association. Gordon's topic is solicitor's negligence in will and trust drafting and planning and it was purposely placed at the end of the proceedings today hoping to shake the hell out of all of us uh, before we go on our merry ways to the golf course or the uh, the tennis courts today. So with that, I'll allow Gord to tell us all about solicitor's negligence. Thank you, Brian. I'm particularly pleased to uh, be last on the agenda today. Finishing last reminds me of my career at law school. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, Jay and Al for not dealing with my topic exhaustively as Mike has done and Brian has already done. You can, you can tell from reading our articles that we didn't get together and write them. We all wrote them independently and said much the same thing. And to a large extent, we agreed with each other. I'm glad about that. It's no surprise to us today that there's more litigation now than there was 10 years ago. It's no surprise that there's more estate litigation. We have will constructions and dependence relief applications, validity contests. We also have more professional negligence claims. Now, I have this morning's Globe and Mail. I thought I might read it since Brian and, and uh, Mike have dealt with my topic, but <laughs> perhaps not. The front page is particularly interesting. We have the headline, Jobless Figures Make August Cruelest Month, Ottawa's Economic Policy to Continue, and then the smiling faces of Chrétien and Lalonde. <laughs> we also have on the, on the front page, jury ruled able to set damages in surgery cases. Now, again, on the front page, we have a reference to a professional negligence claim, and they're coming up all the time. It's not just doctors, accountants, architects, and yes, lawyers. And Obviously, we as lawyers have to take a large part of the responsibility for the proliferation of these claims. Um, after all, we take them into court. And we may even encourage clients to, uh, to proceed with them. And uh, we better make sure that we're not parties in these claims in the future. Now, the purpose of, of my paper today is not to tell you how to defend an action if you get him one, but hopefully 
comments will, will relate to how to avoid an action. If you're going to be involved in a malpractice action, better as counsel than as party. Now, I don't have any particular expertise in, in the area of, of negligence. I'm not going to tell you that I have a formula and this is how you do it, although there have been some suggestions uh, and perhaps I know more about negligence here than anybody for personal reasons. I hope that's not true. What I do hope to do today with, with some of the horror stories that, uh, that I propose to give you is stimulate some thought. Uh, this type of program gives me an opportunity to uh, philosophize a little bit. I'd like to tell you some of my thoughts about the function of a commercial lawyer. Commercial lawyer is many things. Obviously, the uh, commercial lawyer must be a public relations specialist in order to get along with clients and convince the client that A, the fee is fair, and, and B, he's done the right job. He's got to be a manager of people because of the office staff that he must uh, support. Certainly a manager of paper. Um, those of us who do estate administration know that we are, uh, in many cases, just administrators and pushing paper around and making sure things follow the proper routine. Per perhaps, I, I think most importantly, a lawyer is a manager of risks. Look at a fact situation and identify what the risk is and then explain that risk to the client in terms that the client can understand. Perhaps he can eliminate the risk by drafting a contract carefully, shifting the risk to another party in the contract. If you can't do that, you better shift the risk away from himself by advising the client, preferably in writing, and getting instructions from, from the client, preferably in writing. Now, it's, it's in this capacity as, as risk manager that I'd, I'd like you to assess the, the remaining material. You may not agree with me as to the extent of the risk, and actually I'm not going to try and say what the extent of the risk is. I'd like to suggest that there are risks and you have to decide how far you want to go to protect yourself against those risks. Now in any question of negligence, as we all know, uh, negligence involves a, or to be liable in a negligence action, there must be a duty of care owed to a plaintiff, there must be a breach of that duty, and there must be damage resulting from it. So let's first look at what the standard of care might be in connection with preparation of, of wills and trusts. Now while the, the heading is uh, preparation of wills and trusts, I've really confined my remarks to wills. I think the, the same principles apply with respect to trusts. Um, so I'm just combining them under the one heading. In order to determine what the standard of care is, I think we have to look at what the client expects. The client expects to end up with an enforceable document that will express his wishes in the disposition of his property. Certainly if you were a client, you wouldn't expect anything less than that. So in order to carry out the client's instructions and to give him what he wants, we have to ensure that he's got the legal capacity, as Michael and Brian have suggested. We've got to make sufficient inquiries to ascertain his complete intention. We've got to advise as to the possible alternative ways of accomplishing that intention, or perhaps advising him of things that he hadn't considered that may affect that intention. We should ensure that the will is prepared promptly, in accordance with the instructions, obviously. It should be free from ambiguities and uncertainties and it should provide the adequate administrative provisions to <coughs> permit the executors to carry out the functions that they've been directed to do. Now, for many years, the solicitor's liability to his client was, was uh, limited to contract. If he breached his contract and there was damage, he had to pay. Well, that really wasn't much of a problem in the wills area because until the client died, there could be no damage. Once the client died, there couldn't be any damage to the client or his estate. It was only the beneficiaries who were suffering. Now, this, 
this absence of liability may account in some respects for development of, of practice in past years when one might just talk to the client on the phone briefly and the client says, yes, I'd like a will leaving everything to my spouse and gift over to my kids. A two-page document goes out and uh, maybe it's executed out of the office and that might be all you see of it. If there's no liability, we don't have to work very hard to shield ourselves from liability. We didn't have any in the first place. And we can get a we can get fifty dollars or thirty-five or whatever for throwing out this little piece of paper. Well, times are changing. Whittingham versus Crease, 1978, decision of the Supreme Court of uh, British Columbia. In that case, the uh, defendant solicitor prepared the will in accordance with instructions, tended on the, be on the testator to have it signed, and unfortunately asked the spouse of a beneficiary to witness the will. And at that time in, in uh, British Columbia, that rendered the gift void, as it did in Ontario for many years. And we have curative legislation now which would permit the beneficiary to bring an application to court and perhaps have the gift saved. But the gift was void, and the plaintiff sued for the amount of gift that he would have received, and the plaintiff succeeded. It's a landmark case in Canada. And Mr. Justice Aikens, Aiken, yeah, Aikens, said because the solicitor undertook the responsibility, and I've underlined the words undertook the responsibility, of preparing the will, that he must have he must have undertaken or impliedly represented that he would have an effective document. Back to the testator's intention again, of having this effective document that will dispose of his property the way he wants it. And he had an implied duty of care to the plaintiff beneficiary on the strength of that implied representation because that beneficiary was re reasonably foreseeable. And the absence of action by the plaintiff beneficiary was immaterial. In other words, the plaintiff didn't even have to rely on this implied representation and do something, as the Headley Byrne uh, Heller type of case provided that there had to be the statement and the reliance on the statement. Now that was closely followed by an English case, Ross and Cotters. In this case, the solicitors sent out the will to the client with instructions as to execution, but not very good instructions. And again, we had the spouse of a beneficiary witness the will. And again, the, the gift to that beneficiary was void. The beneficiary sued. The solicitors in the case admitted negligence. So there was no question of what was the standard of care or was the duty breached, but the defense was no duty to this particular party, didn't have a contract with the plaintiff. And Mr. Justice McGarry, who was no slouch, said that because the solicitor could reasonably foresee that the third party might be injured if the solicitor didn't use reasonable care, that the solicitor was responsible in damage. Damages, excuse me. Now, these cases personally cause me little trouble. I think they're uh, obvious areas of, of negligence. There was damage. The party was reasonably foreseeable. So the solicitor paid. Now, we also have an element of unjust enrichment, perhaps, because there's another beneficiary of that estate who got more than he should have. And the solicitor has, in effect, increased the size of that estate by making payments to one of the beneficiaries. And I think that's a defect of our legislation. And that's not the purpose of my topic here. But personally, I think there should be some way for the courts to, to cure this obvious mistake. Now, 
We do have legislation which allows us to go to court where a witness has, has signed as beneficiary or, a, or a spouse of a witness and prove that no undue influence was used and the gift can be saved. But there are other areas in, in the dealing with execution where there could be problems. Take, for example, the case where the client comes into the office and signs the will and the will is witnessed by the secretary and for some reason the lawyer doesn't sign it at that time, puts the will away. We've got a will with one signature. That can't be saved by the present statutory provisions. Now, Al Brule told a story a long time ago, which, uh, which I've remembered, about uh, that type of thing which actually happened. The solicitor was called and told that a client had died and that he had the will. He pulled it out and was horrified to find that there was only one signature on it. It was his secretary's. And he did know that he had been in the presence of the testator when in the office. He remembered the testator being there to sign the will. So he did what any solicitor would do, I guess. He went up to the funeral home, and in the presence of the testator, he witnessed the will. <laughs> Seems to be a practical solution to the problem. Now, the cases we've talked about deal with problems negligence in relation to the execution of the will. And as Brian has alluded, um, I don't think that, that we're going to be limited to cases involving the negligence in the execution of the will. And we'll probably very shortly be fa facing claims dealing with negligence in the preparation of the will. Now, I've, I've given a number of examples. There are four examples here, and I'm going to refer to them briefly. The first example I call the failure to use reasonable skill example. 